this morning to 2 Corinthians 3.1. I tell you what, becoming a grandpa has kind of got me energized. I think I, I think I concerned the family, though, yesterday. As I was thinking and talking, Rachel was finishing up. I, I looked at Rachel and I said, uh, I, I, I said, do, do they make harnesses for babies that small? And she said, oh, yeah. And I said, really? She said, oh, yeah. And, and then I realized what she was talking about was what I was talking about. And I said, so we can go repelling together. <laughs> she said, no, no. I said, well, I'm just thinking out loud. I shouldn't be doing that. But, uh, uh, but I'm excited today. And I believe that, that God wants us to be excited about what he's doing. And how many of you know, at the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God descended down into that room, there was a little bit of excitement going on. Did you know that? <laughs> Did you know when the power of the Spirit of God moved in their midst, it pretty much turned the whole town upside down. You know, here today, you can imagine if we had, if the Holy Spirit just came and, and there, were act, there was actually flames of fire coming, uh, we'd have a lot of people running for the fire extinguishers, wouldn't we? <laughs> oh, come on, think about it. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but the Spirit of God knew it. Just, maybe, maybe just all of us find ourselves just face first in His presence. Would the city of Newark even know about it? So something took place, an excitement, that caused the entire city to be drawn. And I believe that, that God wants us to have that same excitement and enthusiasm that they received on the day of Pentecost. And this morning, we're going to take a look at what caused that to happen. Now, we're going to do it from a different angle, so you're going to have to follow me on this. But if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And as I said, the title of the message is The Authentic Life is the Spirit-Led Life. And that statement is so vitally important. If you aren't being led by the Spirit, I want you to know that your certificate of authenticity may not be correct. But if you are led by the Spirit of God, you can, you can know that you know that you know that you are a child of the living God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 says, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Are we beginning to brag again is what Paul's saying? Or do we need, uh, as some, letters of com commendation? I've got to blink a couple times. There we go. To you or from you. You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men. And I, I, I probably need to sit, some folks are thinking, oh, pastor's getting old. I don't know what's going on with my eyes today. I just went to the eye doctor this week, and they said I got 2020 and 2025, so I, I should be good. <laughs> by the way, that's a miracle of God. So I'm, I'm believing in that. Being manifested that you are a letter of Christ. I want you to think about that. Being manifested that you are a letter of Christ. You are a correspondence that Christ has written to this world. You are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Your life is a letter written by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Now listen to this. Who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit. Not the letter of the law, but the Spirit of the law. Why? For the letter of the law, the letter kills. But the Spirit of the law, the Spirit, gives life. Father, I pray that you will reveal this in a greater way than we have ever grasped before. That the letter of the law, legalism, is death. 
But the spirit of the law, oh, Father, I thank you that the spirit of the law brings life in that life more abundantly. Arrest our thought processes today, I pray. Keep our hearts in the palm of your hand as you lead us in your word we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now as we consider this, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. And I got this definition that says, the letter of the law can be defined as any formal code, rule, regulation, or principle that must be followed according to governmental mandates or policies. Got that? The letter of the law is what has been mandated, has been written down in, in this policy, these governmental mandates. The, that is the letter of the law. An example of the letter of the law be, in, in, in the spirit of the law, jaywalking. How many of you have ever jaywalked? Oh, come on, everybody. We've, we've, we've all crossed someplace where there wasn't a crosswalk. So as we look at jaywalking, the reason jaywalking is illegal is to protect the pedestrian, the motorist, and other pedestrians. Situation one, if you, in the course of jaywalking, cause an accident where a motorist reacts to miss hitting you, and loses control, hitting and injuring himself and others, should you be cited for jaywalking? Yep. Pretty easy. Yeah. The letter of the law. Next question, two. If you're parked across from a restaurant and seeing there's no traffic and it's raining with the nearest crosswalk 30 yards down the road and you run across the street, should you be ticketed for jaywalking? Oh. I'll be honest with you. In the first case, I would say, write me up, officer. In the second case, if he stopped me as I'm walking into the restaurant, says, excuse me, sir, I'm writing you a ticket. I would look at him and say, are you kidding me? Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll be honest, that's just where I'd, I, what? What, what did I do? Well, you jaywalked. But there's, there hasn't been a car down the street since I parked, and there still isn't one. And you, it's right pouring down rain, and you wanted me to go all the way down there, cross the street, and come back. I, oh, give me your badge number. <laughs> Who do you think? My son in law's a police. No, I wouldn't go there. <laughs> but the letter of the law has its purpose and its place. But the spirit of the law is to keep us safe and to help us to do what's right. And I would be honest, I, I would, quite honestly, if I was watching that and saw a police officer give someone a ticket for crossing where there's no traffic and there's no place to cross, I'd be saying, hey, come on, officer. I understand that the letter of the law says this and this. But what's the spirit of the law about, and how do you interpret that? As we stop and consider the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, it comes down to knowing the right thing to do. James chapter 4, verse 17 says, Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. That's pretty cut and dry, isn't it? You ever had someone come to you and say, oh, well, uh, I just do a little bit of this. That's not a sin, is it? You know, we live in a day and age where, you know, and I'll be honest with you, I've had some people with good arguments. Hey, I was in an Assembly of God church on a missions trip, and they had actual wine in their communion. Oh, that's a tough one to deal with. <laughs> so is it okay for me to drink? Well, Will smoking send you to hell? Is marijuana really that bad if it's medicinal? 
I mean, really, all these things coming together. And the scripture makes it so plain and so clear. The spirit of the law is what it comes down to. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. By the way, if you're asking, is this sin? Amen. It probably is. <laughs> if it worries you, if you've got a concern, if, if you're convicted a little bit, we need to step back and say, do I know better than doing that? Oh, I remember when I was down in Georgetown, I was going to change the name to protect the innocent, but he's not. <laughs> oh, but his, his name's Sam. He's a pastor down there. And uh, one day I was, I went into the print, printing shop and I was getting some stuff done. And as I was getting ready to leave, Sam was crossing the street. And he says, hey, brother, how, how about joining us tonight? A couple, a uh, few pastors in the area are getting together. And I said, really, what's going on? He said, oh, we're having a, a poker tournament. <laughs> I said, Sam? I got to ask a question. Are you gambling there? He said, oh, are you going to be a problem? I said, Sam, is there going to be gambling there? He said, yes, there's going to be. He said, well, if you don't like that, you definitely won't, won't like the cigars and the alcohol. I said, Sam, I can't, I can't come. I can't. He said, oh, th that's not a sin. And I said, maybe for you it's not. I'll leave that up to you and God. But God has convicted me that I'm not able to do those things. Yeah. And the scripture says to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him, that is sin. A, a good explanation of the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, I looked up in the story of David and Bathsheba. How many of you might be a little familiar with that story? <laughs> David and Bathsheba. Let's take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 11. This first verse says a mouthful. And we need to take heed to this. We go on into the story for what we're, get, what we're going to accomplish. But it says, then it happened. In the springtime, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab, his servant, with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed home at Jerusalem. The very first statement in the springtime when kings go out to battle, jump to the end, David stayed home. In the spring, when it was his time to go do what it was, he was called to do, he had other people to do it. He was going to stay home. He had done, I've done my share. Remember, the, I beat a giant. Remember that? I got chased around by King Saul all those years. I could have killed him a couple times, but I did the righteous and right thing. I'm a little tired. It's springtime. I'm going to stay home. So that evening, David, theologians say it was, it was probably warm. David had, had found a cool spot during the day probably to rest and take a nap instead of doing what he should have been doing. And, and then in the evening when it got a little cooler, he went out on the roof where it was nice and he's just walking around kind of bored. The Bible says that as David walked on the roof, he looked around and I'm sure he had never been on that roof before to know that the public bathing area was right off this side. But he happened to walk over there and he looked out and as he looked out he, he notices well, it's ladies bathing day. <laughs> Whoop. I better go back over the other side. No. Well would you look at her? Who is that? Wow. Who is that? And so he sends word he says who is that one? Now stop and think about it. David I'm sure he didn't go up to his, the guy that was serving him and give a description of this woman. Instead, he pulled him up on the, see her? Right over there, the one, yeah, she's in the shower camp, right there. Who is that? And his response was, that's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, 
the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Remember last week when I, I think it was last week, it was, uh, yeah, last week, I tried it twice. When I had the kids down here, I was talking about David's three mighty men. If you look on, David not only had his three mighty men, but he had 30 all together. And if you look, you find that Uriah the Hittite was one of his mighty men, one of his main guys, and it's his wife. But not only that, it is the, the daughter of Eliam. And Eliam, the word Eliam translated means a covenant. And it is a covenant that says from God saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. So the daughter of someone whose name represents a covenant with God. Evidently, David didn't make the covenant with his eyes that I will not look on anything that I shouldn't look on. But he takes the daughter of a guy named after the great covenant that God has made with man. And it says on verse 4, David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lied with her, laid with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived. And she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Then David sent for, to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah the Hittite, the husband of the lady that David just got pregnant. And David brings him in, and the Bible goes on and says, he does the kingly thing, Uriah, tell me about the battle. How's it going out there? How are our men there? He didn't care. He says, well, that's good. I'm glad you brought me that information. Now, go home and relax with your wife. Hopefully, you'll think it's your child in a few months. The Bible says David even sent him a present. Verse 9 says, but Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. It goes on and tells us that David tried to convince Uriah to go home. Can you imagine this? The king is, Uriah, you've been at battle all this time. You've served me well. I brought you home. You gave me the report. Go home and spend some time with your family. You deserve it. You earned it. He's conning him, trying to anyways. As we look at verse 11, Uriah said to David, and this, you talk about him, you talk about a man. Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life and by the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. As you look at his response, my fellow soldiers, my countrymen are in the open field camping. They're putting their lives on the line. They're fighting for me and my family and for you, king. I know where I should be. Can you imagine where David was at? Ooh. He's, he's telling me I should have been down there too. Who does he think he is? So David tells him, okay, you stay the night and go back tomorrow to the battle. And then the Bible tells us that David has him come and eat with him, and he, he works him until he gets him drunk. And even in his drunken state, Uriah refuses to go home. Verse 14, now in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. This is ironic. And this is... This is so cool. Can you think about, this is a man after God's own heart. He's not where he should be. He looks out where he shouldn't be looking. He chooses someone that's not to be chosen. He brings her into his bedroom. He has relationships with her that he has no reason to have. And then when he gets caught, he tries to cover it up. 
And when he can't cover it up, here's what he does. This letter goes back. And he had written in the letter saying, Place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that, they may, so that he may be struck down and die. You talk about going from cold to just, bitter cold. And that's what Joab did. You see, as we look at this, David was fulfilling the letter of the law that could be tied to him. Well, if Uriah's dead, she's a widow, I can marry her, it's cool. The letter of the law that can be tied to him. He was neglecting the letter of the law that could be hidden. He was putting that off to the side. I can hide this fact. And he sent that man to his death. And the letter of the law said, what you're doing, if you don't get caught, you're okay. As a matter of fact, in this day and age that we live in, people try to manipulate the letter of the law all the time. Recently, we had a president not too many years back that held to the letter of the law when he said, I did not have sex with that woman. And the letter of the law said that was correct. <clears throat> the spirit of the law would tell anyone that has any compassion that a married man having any sexual relationship with a young lady is wrong. The problem is that we like the fact that we feel like we can manipulate the letter of the law, or we think so. How many of you know it? It came back. It always comes back. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. And when we live in a day and age where we live by the letter of the law and we try to manipulate that law, the fact is we try to justify ourselves. But in fact, we are actually tying ourselves to sin when we hold to the letter of the law. David tied himself... He had, you, you stop and look at the life of David. Consider that. The little shepherd boy singing and playing and worshiping God. That's what he did, the Bible tells us. His father calls him in from the field, tells him, take this stuff to your brothers as food. When you get there, find out how the battle's going and come back. We know the story. He gets there, he hears Goliath. Telling Israelite they're nothing and their God is nothing. And he stands up and takes his little, little slingshot and five little stones. And he walks out to the battle and he takes on Goliath and he wins. We see from there he goes on and, and leads armies to win incredible battles that are, that are miracles of God. We see, as I said, he runs for his life I think 11 different times. Saul tried to kill David so that he wouldn't take over his place as king. We see all these incredible victories that David's involved in and this one event that lasted over, what, maybe a couple months? And it scarred everything about David and how he's remembered from that point on. As I said, the problem is we like the fact that we can manipulate the letter of the law, or we think so, but in fact, we're actually tying ourselves to sin when we hold to the letter of the law. My question today is, how often do you justify your actions? Well, I'm doing this and this for the Lord, so surely he won't mind me not doing what he asked me to do. And in fact, what we're doing is we're tying ourselves to sin when we do that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty and freedom. This morning, I want us to consider the letter of the law and the real spirit of the law why it's made. 
See, back in Jewish history, it tells us that 50 days after the first Passover, Moses was bringing the law down to the people. I want you to get that in your head. They had been through all the plagues, the last plague being the death of that firstborn child, and they put blood over the door and the posts, and the death angel passed over those that had the blood applied. <clears throat> that first Passover, they have run from the Egyptian army. They came and found the, the Red Sea at flood stage. A cloud comes down, separates them from the army. Flood stage, Red Sea. God tells Moses, hold out that staff that you once threw down and, turned in, and it turned into a snake. Hold that staff out. And as he did, the Lord separated the water and dried the land and they crossed. They get to the other side and the Egyptians see the cloud rising and they see the water separating. And Pharaoh says, follow them. And they do. And the Israelites are looking back, seeing this army that they had just escaped, and they're taking their escape route, and they're coming through that dry land with water on both sides of them. When the hand of the Lord lifted and all that water came in and killed that huge army. And they sat on the side of the river that God had protected them and sent them to, and they, they sang this song, I believe it was Miriam that put this song together. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. And they're celebrating. Woo! We've free at last. And then Moses says, God has told me to go up this mountain. I'll be back. And he goes up and spends time with Almighty God. God gives them the Ten Commandments, the letter of the law. And as Moses is coming back down the mountain, he hears singing and dancing, but it's a different kind of singing and dancing. When he gets down there, he sees a golden calf, and they're worshiping this golden calf. When he looks at Aaron, he says, What are you doing? And Aaron says, Oh, are these people. And all of a sudden, this golden calf jumped out of the fire. I don't know. <laughs> Fifty days after the Passover, 50 days after all this had taken place, here they were worshiping a false god. The Bible tells us that Moses ground that calf up, the gold into dust. He spread it over the water and made the people drink it. But if that wasn't enough, he said, who is on the Lord's side or who is, who is for the Lord? And the Levites stepped forward, pulled out their swords. And the Bible says that that day, 50 days after the first Passover, the Levites killed 3,000 people as the letter of the law was given. Fast forward. The crucifixion of Christ takes place at the last. As the Passover lamb is being slaughtered, Jesus is being crucified. Fifty days after that last Passover, we find Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. The scripture goes on and tells us that Peter preached an incredible message 
And verse 41 says, so then, now remember, this is 50 days after the last Passover. So then, those who had received the word were baptized, and that day there was added about 3,000 souls. When the letter was given, 3,000 died. But where the Spirit was given, 3,000 came to life. The letter of the law kills, but the spirit of the law gives life. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Hmm. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 explains this even a little bit in greater detail. Therefore, there is now, listen to this, children of God, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God gives life. Jesus Christ, the baptizer in the Spirit, where it says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Oh, church, can we get this? For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh. Listen to this. Who do not walk according to the letter of the law, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life, and peace, an authentic life, is a life that is led by the Spirit of God. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Have you noticed that? When your mind gets set on the flesh, you get angry with God. He starts interrupting and he's inconvenient in what you're doing. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But those that are led by the Spirit of God, the Bible says they are the sons of God. And this morning, I want to ask you, are you being led by the Spirit of God? What are my prayers to my children? Is God, don't let them make any decisions without asking you first. Because I know if they ask God first and then they listen to him, they're going to be so blessed. And as I was praying about this and re receiving this, the Spirit of God began speaking to my heart that he wants me to demonstrate this fact to our church. And I begin saying, Lord, I know I've, I've told people, like Paul said, follow me, watch me, do what I do, and your life will be better. But, but that's, that's a lot of responsibility. But the Lord spoke to my heart. And he said to tell you. And as I told the men this morning, I will let you down. So I apologize in advance. 
But I promise you, I will do my best to make sure I'm living by the spirit of the law and following the spirit of God. And even in the worst of times, even in the struggles, even in the disappointments, my life will be blessed and you will see that blessing. Because God wants you to live this blessed life. And if you are ready to be blessed, if you are ready to say, Lord, I want to live by the spirit of the law. I'm tired of looking for loopholes and reasoning and justification for doing what I know you don't want me to do. And I know now that if I know to do good and don't do it, I'm committing sin. If this morning you would say, I am going to purpose my life to live by the spirit of the law. And I want you to stand with me and join me as we surrender ourselves to the King of Kings and the Lord of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you that we don't live under the letter of the law anymore. Lord, all the thou shalt not, I, I know they've got their purpose, and that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, he came to fulfill the law. Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us to live by your spirit. Holy Spirit, now I pray that you would have your way in our hearts and our lives. Reveal those things in us that don't need to be there. And give us the courage and the strength to let them go and to leave them. And then, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will begin revealing to us those strengths that you've given us that we didn't realize that we had. I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts that we might more clearly see. I pray, Holy Spirit, that as you flow down upon us and through us and begin revealing to us the great tools that you've placed in our life, help us to submit to that, to, to embrace that, and to be about your business, recognizing that it's not by our might or our power, but it's by your spirit. And Father, when the difficulties come, we're not going to revert back to the letter of the law and begin justifying and doing. We're going to trust you. We're going to trust you, Father. And we will walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Father, for anyone here that, that doesn't have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that has not been washed in the blood of the Lamb and isn't ready to stand in your presence, Father, I pray for them right now that they will be released of the bondage, the legalism that they've created in themselves, trying to fit you into a box. Lord, I pray that they would be delivered and that would be just something that falls behind them. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that they are being washed in the blood of the Lamb of Jesus. The old things are passing away and everything is becoming new right now. Now, Father, I speak a blessing, not only upon, but into each heart and each life here today. That blessing of walking by the Spirit of God, that blessing of being empowered by your anointing, 
That blessing of not being held back by the flesh and the things of this world. But they will be violent for the kingdom of God. Your word says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Help us as we are led by the spirit of God to stand strong, to do what you call us to do, to be a light in a dark world. Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name, as we are led by the Spirit of God, we will submit to you when others are drawn to us and we are to present the love of Christ to them and demonstrate that love. Father, that we would replicate ourselves in them, that we would live lives where we could say, as Paul said, follow me. Follow me. As I follow Christ, follow me and follow Christ. And then this last statement of just follow Christ. Father, help us to be led by the Spirit of God. And as you do that, Lord, we are excitedly awaiting all that you want to do. Thank you now. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Walk in the Spirit of God. Listen to the Spirit of God. And let His glory be. Lord bless you.